if anybody was to find out that we were harboring a Bible in our home, our family could be killed. We could be gone. We were pressed on every side. Full of fear and troubled thoughts. Isabella McMillan grew up in communist Romania. She's our guest on this episode of GPS, God, People, Stories. I'm Phil Fleischman. My co-host, Jim Kirkland, is out of town, so he won't be here for this episode. Isabella recently shared her story during morning devotions here at the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And we were so touched by it that we want to share it with you. GPS. God. People. Stories. Isabella McMillan came to the United States in 2002. She discovered a world that was vastly different from the one she had known in communist Romania. And if you know anything about communism, we were not allowed to worship. We were not allowed to, to go to church. We were not allowed to even have a Bible and walk down the street with a Bible in our hands because that could cost our lives. And so because of that, we didn't know about God. We didn't know about the Bible. So by the time I was three years old, my mom and dad, they were very hardworking people. They worked in a factory their entire lives to, to try to provide for us. And so they left us at home. I was three years old. My brother uh, is three years older than me, so he was six years old. He was in charge of me, which I didn't like very much. But we had a key around our neck, and, and we had very, very simple instructions of what we had to do to do this life on our own. So we had to get up with an alarm clock on our own, and we would get up, we would brush our teeth, get dressed, eat our breakfast, and go to school. My brother had the responsibility to make sure that I made it to school safely. And then after school was done, I would meet up with my brother, and then we would go home, and with this key around our neck, we would let ourselves in the house. And the instructions, again, were very simple. We had to eat our lunch, we had to do our homework, and we had to behave. And that behaving part got tricky sometimes. I remember when I was about seven years old, one day we got home, we did everything that we were supposed to do, and so we were just kind of looking around in the house for something to do. And as we were looking around in the house, we we noticed, we had an area rug in our living room, and we noticed that there was something underneath our area rug that was bulging. And so we pulled up that area rug to see what was there, and one of the tiles of our wooden floor was popped up. And so we picked up that tile, And the tile came up, and then the next tile came up, and the next tile came up. And before we knew, there was a small hole in the floorboard of our house. Scary thought, because we lived on the fourth floor of a flat apartment building. We couldn't quite see down to our neighbors, but in that hole that day, we found the Bible. Never heard about it before. We didn't know what it was. And we pulled this little black book out, and we started reading. Now, think for me. When we just for a second, how would it be if you take this book in your hand, you never heard about it before, you don't know what it is, and you take it into your hand and you start reading it? There were some exciting stories. We love stories. We had about three books in our house. We knew them inside out. We loved to read. We didn't have electricity most nights, so our big mischievous behavior at night would be to get under a blanket with a flashlight and read to each other, my brother and I, when we were supposed to be asleep. And so we loved to read. And we pulled this book out, And we were taught in school that you read a book from start to finish. So we started at the beginning. And if you can think with me just for a second to a couple of the stories that are at the beginning of this book. And we started reading these stories. And they were just amazing to us. We have never heard these stories before. And I remember mom and dad, when they came home that day, we ran up to the door. And we were so excited. We were telling them all about this book that we found. And I remember telling them all about Noah and, the, and all the water that covered the earth and this big boat that he built and how big this boat must have been and just how excited we were about these stories. And my dad looked at us. And we just knew that something was not right. And when my dad looked at us and he said, you... Take that book back where you found it and do not ever take it out again and do not tell anybody what you found in our house. See, my dad knew that if anybody was to find out that we were harboring a Bible in our home, our family could be killed. We could be gone. There were people who were disappearing left and right and nobody ever knew where they were. And that could have been us. And so he took this book from us and he tucked it back and he put all the tiles back. He put the carpet back and we didn't speak another word in our house that night. So we knew that this was serious, but my dad never really told us why we could not do this. So you know how it is when you tell a child not to do something, right? It becomes a little more exciting and you want to figure it out why. 
So the next day, we came home and we could hardly wait to eat our lunch and do our homework so we can get to this little book because now we knew this treasure that we had in the floorboard of our home. Now with that being said, I'm not very proud that we disobeyed our parents, but we did play it smart. We made sure that by the time mom and dad came home, it was always tucked back in. And they never knew that we were taking this book out day after day after day and reading it. And can I just tell you that I remember sitting even in school and thinking, I cannot believe, like, what, what can be the next story that will come in this book? And just the excitement of running home so we can do everything that we were supposed to do first very quickly so we can get to this book. And so as time was passing by, and, I, and we were reading and we were learning a lot about this book, I was in the fifth grade, about 11 years old, when one of my classmates came up to me, and he invited me to go to church with him. I never heard the word church before. He was going to a little underground church down the street, about a mile down the street from our house. And it was, wasn't literally underground. It was just a little house that looked nothing different like all the other houses. And he was going there Saturday nights after dark. And he invited me to go. I got so excited. He was telling me that it's story time. I love stories, so I wanted to go. I didn't care about anything else, what, what all that it meant. It was story time, so I wanted to go. I went home, and I asked my dad if I could go to church, and I give you one guess what he said. He was not quite so excited. And I just nagged and nagged and nagged until he couldn't take it any longer. And he finally said, if your brother goes with you, then you can go. And that's how my brother and I, in my fifth grade year, started going to this little underground church a mile down the street, Saturday nights after dark, by schedule. And what that meant is that everybody who signed up to go, you were given a specific time when you had to arrive so that it would not draw attention from the outside world. Everybody would not arrive at the same time. When I got there and we sat down, we were sitting in a small circle, about 12 of us, and there was a pastor, and he was reading to us from a big hardcover orange book. And it was just stories, and then who, what, where questions. He couldn't, he couldn't tell us more about it. He couldn't explain to us that there's a big God behind his stories. He couldn't take the risk of doing any of that. All he did was just simply read stories and pray quietly in his heart that we will understand what these stories mean. And a couple of months after I started going to this little church, one Saturday afternoon, we were sitting there, and he was reading a story, and I'm sitting there thinking, I know this story. I heard this story from somewhere. And as I realized where I heard this story, my excitement, I raised my hand, and I said, I know this story. I have this book in my house. And he didn't really react. He just very gently pulled me to the side after everybody was gone, and he said, tell me about it. And so I told him how we found this book in our house and how we were reading it, and my parents really didn't know, and, and we are so excited, and we are taking it out, and we are reading more and more and learning more and more. And he said, you have the same book that I have. And so on that day, he gave me a lot of insight into a lot of things. But from that day, he took me under his wing, and he started discipling me without me even knowing what he really was doing. But from that day on, I brought all my annoying questions because I have to admit I was one of those kids that I always had my hand up in school and everywhere else. I had the good questions, bad questions, annoying questions, all the questions. And I would bring my questions to him. And he would answer so patiently every time. I remember even one time coming up to him. I was, I was maybe 12 years old. I don't remember exactly. But I remember going to church, and I had my hand up, and I was so excited. And he knew me by then. He knew not to ask anything of me when everybody else was there because he never knew what would come out of my mouth. But he pulled me to the side, and I remember looking at him and saying, have you read Romans 12? And he said, I sure have. Have you? And I said, I did, but I don't think you know what it means. And he told me, why don't you tell me what it means? And I looked at him and I said, you know me, Romans 12, in the first few verses when it says, do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Doesn't that mean that we shouldn't worry about what the world out there says, that you tell us that we just need to be very safe and we need to be careful? If this is the best book in the world that you are reading from us, like you have been telling us, then why can't we go out there and tell everybody? And that day he looked at me and I remember him just putting his head on my head and just saying, Isabella, one day God will do something big and amazing with you, but right now you better be quiet. 
That pastor was right about the something big and amazing. God has been using Isabella for big things. Today, she works for the Christian relief organization Samaritan's Purse, specifically for their outreach Operation Christmas Child. That's the ministry that sends shoeboxes filled with small gifts to children around the world. Well, this is the story of Isabella's first encounter with Operation Christmas Child and how that encounter changed her life forever. I was about 13 years old. I was in the seventh grade. And it started to get really, really cold. It was September. It started to get really, really cold, and I do not like cold. And I remember going to church with a big idea that I had. I read a lot about prayer, and I heard a lot about prayer, but I didn't know how to do it. I never actually heard somebody pray. I, I didn't know how to do this prayer thing. And so I went to church, and I raised my hand, and once again he pulled me to the side, and I told him, I said, can you teach me how to pray? I read about it. I I heard about it. I don't know how to do this. How do I do this prayer thing? And on that day, he sat me down, and he taught me for the first time in my life how to pray. And he put it so simply. He said, Isabella, you just talk to God like he's your best friend. You tell him what's on your heart, what's on your mind, and he will answer. That's it. And then he added one more thing. God always answers prayers. And I thought to myself, all right, well, that shall work then. And what I really wanted, he asked me, why why do you want to pray? And I said, I want to pray because it's cold outside and I don't like it. And I want it to snow. Because the only way that mom and dad would let us go outside and play, because it was dark at 5.30 in the winters and we didn't have electricity, is if it snowed. And so our saving grace in the winters was if it snowed. Otherwise, we had to go to bed at 5.30 and we didn't want to do that. And so I wanted to pray for snow. And I remember going home. And just sitting down and just just clenching my fist and my eyes and just prayed as hard as I could that God would give me snow. And I believed that he would give it to me. And the next morning, I ran up to the window and I was so excited because I was fully expecting to see snow. And guess what? There was no snow. And I was disappointed, but I was not about to give up. But it was about two and a half months later that it was still not snowing. And I remember going to this little church and I raised my hand and I wasn't quite as excited as usual. And I looked at this pastor and I said, did you know that this prayer thing does not work? And on that day, this pastor looked at me and he taught me a very valuable lesson. He said, Isabella, let me tell you something. God always answers prayers and that will never change. He always did, he always will. But sometimes he answers prayers in a way that we cannot even imagine and we do not expect it. So you keep your eyes open and you keep watching and I promise you, God will answer your prayer. We were about three weeks from Christmas and I thought to myself, okay, God, you have about three more weeks in my book because I want a white Christmas. And in my little understanding of who God was, I put him in my little three-week box and I gave him a deadline And I kept on praying. And Christmas Day came, and it didn't snow, and I was so disappointed. I was kind of done. And I thought, if God cannot give me snow, what can he really do? And it was the day after Christmas. People started running on the streets. And when people ran on the streets in Romania, it meant one thing. There was something at the grocery store. And we as kids, we were trained to put our shoes on and run as fast as we could. And get in line. It didn't matter what was there. We didn't have it. So we didn't even ask the question. Just got in line to get whatever it was. And so as people were running on the street, my brother and I, we put our shoes on and we started running. And people passed by the grocery store and we're thinking, where are they going? Have they lost their... You belong to a grocery store in Romania. You can't just go to any grocery store. And as they were running, they looked so excited. We thought we were going to miss out on something. So we kept on following them. And we ended up in the center of our little town and people were shouting, trucks are coming, trucks are coming, trucks are coming. And pretty soon, trucks started to pull in and people hopped off of these trucks and they were smiling, something that you don't see in Romania a lot. And they opened the backs of these trucks and they were filled with beautiful, colorful shoeboxes. And this lady came up to me and handed me a box and I looked at her and I thought, there's no way that somebody will come to Romania and give us something for nothing. That just doesn't happen. 
And I looked at her and I said, what do I have to do? Because I don't want to sign up for something later that I, I don't want to sign up for. And she looked at me and she said, you don't have to do anything. It's just simply for you. And then she looked at me and she said, is there anything I can pray with you for on the streets of Romania? And I thought to myself, this is my moment. Would you please pray with me for snow? And so this lady did. She knelt down to come down to my level and she prayed with me right there and then for snow. And she left me there with a beautiful, colorful box in my hand and went on. I've never seen her again. When Isabella opened the box, one thing in particular caught her eye. She had never seen anything like it before, so she didn't know what it was. Then a boy walked up to Isabella and told her to just shake it and see what happens. It was a snow globe. In that moment, it snowed. And also in that moment, Isabella understood Jesus and his love for her in a way she never had before. I expected snow from the sky. But yet he chose to give it to me this way, to simply just look at me and say, Isabella, I am here and I know you and I know your heart and I know your desires and I know your name. Don't doubt me. Isabella ran home, took out the secret Bible and surrendered her life to Jesus. Season by season, I watch him. God used a snow globe to open Isabella's eyes to his love for her and to his faithfulness. What has he used in your life to help you believe that you can trust him? Whatever it is, you don't want to ignore it. Maybe he's used Isabella's story, and maybe he wants to use our website to help you. The address is billygramradio.org. Just click on Grow Your Faith up at the top. That's billygramradio.org. Isabella is going to share a little more about the power of the Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes in just a minute. You're listening to GPS, God, People, Stories, a podcast production of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. We preached in seven of Romania's major cities. Billy Graham. In every city, tens of thousands of people came to hear the preaching of the gospel, often gathering many hours before the service. Not only was every church or cathedral filled to overflowing, but often vast crowds jammed the streets outside. More than that, we saw large numbers commit their lives to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It was an unprecedented display of spiritual hunger and renewal in the hearts of thousands in Romania. We've never seen such widespread interest in the gospel in any other country of Eastern Europe. Certainly, God is still at work in our world and he still is able to forgive and change our hearts. Now, back to Phil Fleischman. So, as a child in Romania, Isabella McMillan got a snow globe in the Operation Christmas Child shoebox she received back in 1990. Now, if you're packing a shoebox this year, you can't put a snow globe in it. They're not allowed anymore because they can break and leak. Isabella says even though some of the rules have changed, the message of the shoeboxes hasn't. When God's people come together and they say, let's do something simple so that the gospel can spread all around the world. That's what you do when you pack a shoebox. These shoeboxes did not come in the name of Samaritan Spurs or in the name of Franklin Graham. They came in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to thank Isabella McMillan for sharing her story on this episode of GPS. And we want to thank you for listening. We'd also like to ask you to let us know how Isabella's story touched you. You can do that by leaving us a comment. And if you're not following us on Facebook yet, you can take care of that by searching for Billy Graham Radio. Also, a quick reminder that the Decision America Tour still has a few cities left to visit. Franklin Graham's holding prayer rallies in every state capital. He's sharing the message of Jesus, and he's also challenging Christians to live out their faith boldly at home, in public, and at the ballot box. You can learn more about it at DecisionAmericaTour.com. 
I'm Phil Fleischman. My co-host Jim Kirkland will be back for the next episode. GPS, God, People, Stories. It's an outreach of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Always good news. I will open my hands, will